He obtained these masterpieces from archaeologists, farmers and tradesmen at curiosity shops and auctions in Cairo, Giza, Paris and St. Petersburg. He picked them out one by one like a jeweler choosing stones for a royal crown. They are all different, but when put together, they paint an amazing picture of the past. And there is this mysterious shroud. Where is it from? How did he get a hold of it? Who is depicted on it? One thing has become clear over the past century, that it is unique, and no comparable objects were preserved. Our story begins thousands of kilometers away from hot Egypt, in the cold, bleak St. Petersburg. It was here that on the 29th of January, 1856, the family of a top guild merchant had a son, Vladimir. Vladimir Galinishev. In this city, probably in the summer garden or along the Neva embankment, he would walk with his Swiss tutor. The name of the latter is unknown, but this man fostered love for the ancient world and for ancient Egypt in his pupil, as Vladimir Galinishev later told. And he sparked such interest in the young man that Vladimir began studying the Egyptian language himself. Actually, no one had studied Egypt in Russia before Galinishev. He was a groundbreaker, a pioneer. And moreover, he actually learned the language all by himself, using available records. Can you imagine how genuinely gifted he was? In Europe, the school of Egyptology was just emerging. Later, all Egyptologists were educated in Germany. Galinishev studied the language on his own, and naturally, when he entered the university, he continued his education. He recalled buying his first Egyptian antiquity on Nevsky Prospekt when he was 14. He obtained a stella, a relief, and had it published. He read it himself and published it in a German journal. This event was, in fact, the beginning of Galinishev's collection, which would be built up for almost 30 years. Vladimir Galinishev was a wealthy man. His father left him a considerable amount of money and he used it to the best advantage. As early as in his youth, he began to acquire artifacts and continued doing so for virtually his whole life. There is no other collection of this kind in the world. We have collections assembled by professional scholars, but they largely include average items. As researchers did not have enough funds, they could not afford outstanding artifacts. Alternatively, there are collections of rich people, but they mainly comprise random objects, while this is a collection compiled by a scholar. He had a distinct approach to selecting its items. Galinishev's collection is as outstanding as the collector himself. Not a single false item, not a single duplicate, not a single second-rate object. Virtually all of them deserve the name of a masterpiece. Moreover, his collection covers all the periods of ancient Egyptian history. But it shows that Galinishev was primarily a philologist. His collection features an immense number of ancient inscriptions on all media. Stone, wood, fabric, and papyri. Written records collected by Galinishev could be a valuable asset even for the rich museum in Cairo. Galinishev himself spoke 13 languages. He knew Arabic and studied ancient Egyptian. He learned and, to a great extent, discovered the language. But we are running ahead of ourselves here. As early as during his university studies, Vladimir Galinishev participated in the first Congress of Orientalists, and it was his first success. A new scholar, the Hermitage was delighted to offer him a position, particularly seeing that he didn't need to be on payroll, being rich and therefore didn't require a salary. Galinishev scrutinized and elaborately documented the collection of the museum and the papyri. He made amazing discoveries. He found the papyri, being primarily interested in writing, and systemized the collection. 
he discovered the outstanding record known all over the world as the Galenish of Papyrus. The papyrus includes the teaching of King of Heracepolis, addressed to his son, the prophecy of Neferti. He also finds a remarkable papyrus there, with a record of a fairy tale about a shipwrecked man. This text is now read by all students. Like Caesar's Commentary in Latin, it has become a textbook sample, so to speak. And these wonderful findings, along with others, of course, are elevated by Golanishev to a height unsurpassed until now. As for the transcriptions of Papyri, we basically still use the ones made by him, although, of course, they were subject to alterations, corrections, etc. But it still is at the basis. That is what made him so famous as a scholar. And nowadays, naturally, he remains on the same height. At the same time, Vladimir Galinishev purchased a papyrus with records of hymns in honor of Sobek deity in St. Petersburg. It is a curious story. Having purchased this papyrus at an antique shop in St. Petersburg, he later transferred it for publication to Erman, his old friend, an Egyptologist from Berlin. You see, he did not publish it himself, but handed it over. It is, by the way, yet another remarkable feature of Golanishev. The current researchers are also amazed at his generosity, magnanimity. He would always share his collection. He did not forbid anyone's publications. He did not seek fame or want to be the first to publish something, although these were his personal belongings. But he never hindered studies and was always ready to share. For example, he sent papyri and a famous dictionary he bought in Egypt to Gardiner, a prominent Egyptologist. There are only two dictionaries of this kind, one in Great Britain and the other one here. So, Galinishev was definitely a unique person in terms of personal qualities as well. But let us go back to Galinishev's collection. Though he meticulously worked on the studies of ancient texts and provided a detailed account of the hermitage collections, he left very few descriptions of his own acquisitions. Therefore, today we can only guess the sources of his findings and purchases. And there were a lot of them. Similarly to other collectors, he frequented antique shops and auctions. But the main body of it comes from Egypt. Pocket books contain names of Galinish's long-term dealers, so to speak. In Giza, near Cairo, it was a certain Ali and Luxor, Todros. That is the way he referred to them. These vendors, naturally, would always be aware of the location of excavations, but Galinishev himself also knew about the archaeological sites. Two reports delivered by Galinishev at a meeting of the Russian Archaeological Society are known. These are very detailed records of his journeys in 1884 and 1885, and also in 1888 and 1889. Strictly speaking, they are the only sources telling us what, where, and how he purchased. In these reports, he says that he had visited excavation sites himself. Being fluent in both Egyptian and Arabic, Galinishev was well known in Egypt not only by researchers, but also by the locals. This enabled him to make really precious acquisitions. Galinishev was famous not only as a connoisseur, but also as an incredibly lucky person. Here is an example described in his report on the season of 1888 to 1889. He arrives to Luxor and immediately comes across some peasants who show him two vessels containing fragments of a papyrus. But actually, they had deliberately torn the papyrus into pieces to sell it more expensively. But it is amazing about the papyrus. Galinishev understood at once that it was a very important item, as he could read. And he purchased these two vessels. Unfortunately, as he began his studies, he realized that one fragment was missing, and it was indeed lost for good. But the papyrus is still world famous, as it is the only one of this kind. It is the well-known voyage of Venomum to Byblos, a report by an 11th century Egyptian priest 
who travels to the far off Syria to acquire cedar wood. This sacred cedar would be used to build a ship for the deity of Amun. This is, of course, a historical source of immense value, as well as a literary source. So we are the only ones to have this Wenamum papyrus now, and certainly it is widely known. But Galanishev is an amazing person. I mean, who else would have been able to read and comprehend the significance of this monument on the spot? And then again, the transcription he made has been the basis of its studies to this day. For all of his philological discoveries, Galenishev was also definitely fascinated by the ancient Egyptian art as well. Moreover, he can be said to stand at the origins of its studies. Look at this splendid basalt portrait of Amenemhet III. This item here is wonderful. It is a unique object as well. The only portrait of this kind in the world. It is a masterpiece of the Middle Kingdom period. Galanishev apparently purchased this portrait in the season of 1888 as well. And he compared it with the portrait of King Amenemhet III from St. Petersburg, from the Hermitage collection and with the image on the famous Sphinx of Tanis. There was a king's face, but it had been unclear which one. It was said to be one of the Gigsor kings, but Galanishev carried out something we would now call a brilliant stylistic analysis. It was in fact the first art study of this kind. He compared the portraits and concluded that these sphinxes depict Amenemhet III as well. This discovery made by Galanishev laid the foundations of a new school of research. It is essentially a study of art, a study of portrait as it is. But Galanishev himself did not carry it on. So he did it and then stepped away from it. But this is a sign of his versatility. Galenishev's versatility can also account for the fact that his collection has very rare items, even ones unique for his time, which mark the archaeological breakthroughs of the late 19th and early 20th century. It is the discovery of the archaic Egyptian culture and the late Greco-Roman period. All this shows Galenishev's amazing intuition, his expertise and profound knowledge of the subject. He was among the first people to understand the significance of the Fayim portraits. First, their authenticity was being debated, and it was exactly the time when, in the late 1880s, an exhibition of Theodore Graf's collection was held in Vienna. The collection, including the Fayim portraits, was sold out, and many museums purchased these portraits. Golanishev saw them, and later, arriving to Cairo, he went to the Egyptian museum shop, it was called Bulak Museum at the time, and immediately bought a series of the Fayim portraits there. So, he writes that, first of all, these are not Hellenistic, but later, Roman objects, but that they are perfectly genuine, interesting and important, as these are samples of ancient painting. It might be in the same place, at a museum shop in Cairo, that Galenishev purchased his famous shroud with a stranger. It is associated with a dramatic tale about the sale of the researcher's collection, but for now we will focus on another aspect. Apparently, he bought the other shrouds for his collection in, in Cairo as well, including the shroud with a woman and a child. Unfortunately, not a word was left in Galenishev's notes about it. It is quite possible that shrouds were found and sold frequently at the time. But this was the one he selected. The facts we know about Galenishev rule out even the slightest possibility that he merely went for the first one he saw. He was aware that he was buying something special. It is only to be regretted that he never recorded anything about it. Although, who knows, one day something might be found in his archives, since neither the archival research nor the study of the shroud are over, and studies of ancient Egyptian artifacts are often a very time-consuming process. It is not even a matter of the age of these items, but the enormous gaps in information. It is unknown where they were found, what accompanied them, the context of such findings is typically lost. One thing is clear, currently 
There is no comparison to the shroud in the world. It is totally unique. The 20th century came, and in 1908, a series of events led Galenishev to the need to sell his collection, his labor of love, as he called it. And this marvelous private museum had to be hastily registered, sorted out, and packed. Here is the catalog made by Galenishev himself. Many cards contain nothing more than names and photographs. Apparently, Galenishev was very reluctant to part with the collection. But he had to surrender it, as the money left by his father had run out. His sister's husband had been plunged into debt, and the spending was considerable. In St. Petersburg, however, other rumors also were being circulated. Allegedly, the young stranger depicted on the shroud was haunting Galenishev, and, worn out by his stare, the scholar decided to get rid of the entire collection. The youth was even dubbed Bruce's cursed nephew, in remembrance of the reputed sorcerer Bruce, and thus Galenishev offered his collection for sale to museums. Galenishev was a person we would now call a global citizen. At the same time, he loved his country. This is suggested by the fact that he did his best to leave the collection here, to sell it within Russia. Indeed, he took his time and waited for two years. He was already obliged to pay for the house, the premises where the collection was staying idle, as it could not be removed. But he waited anyway, since otherwise he would have to agree to its sale abroad. In those years, a new museum was being built in Moscow, the Museum of Fine Arts. The museum's founder, Ivan Tsvetaev, professor at Moscow University, succeeded in acquiring the entire collection of Ganesha's ancient Egyptian artifacts. And this event opened the way for a new museum, a museum of originals. You see, initially, Tsvetaev had intended it to be merely a museum of copies. But the purchase of Galenishev's collection radically changed the concept and the image of the museum. Galenishev was not to see his collection again. He did not even attend the opening ceremony of the museum under the pretext of an illness. He started receiving an annuity, 24,000 rubles per year, as the whole amount of 400,000 rubles could not be paid off at once. After selling the collection, Galenishev did not leave off his research. He continued going to Egypt, read and translated ancient Egyptian texts. From 1909, he alternately lived in St. Petersburg and Nice, where his wife had come from. At the same time, he was still employed at the Hermitage. We have his letters dated in 1916, in which he asked to extend his foreign mission. But by that time, he had already essentially moved abroad. In 1917, after the revolution, the payments for the collection were withheld. And Galenishev was broke. He had to seek employment. It was almost a disaster for a wealthy, independent man. But Galenishev had to apply to his colleagues at various universities across the world. He was asking primarily for a teaching position inquiring whether there was any occupation for him. You see, he even uses this wording. Alas, we can feel such bitterness here, as there are no positive replies. In the post-war Europe and the post-war America, all budgets had been cut. That sounds very modern. Alas, well, other motives are involved here too. That is, no one really comprehended Galenishev for everyone was used to seeing him as a well-off, well-situated person. He had never taught, he had not had a position, so to speak. And it was only in 1922 that he received a positive reply with an invitation to chair the new Department of Egyptology at the University of Cairo. Thus, he was the founder of Egyptology in Egypt itself, which had not had its own school before. The Egyptians still cherished the memory of it. No wonder that a monument to Galenishev was set up in the courtyard before the Egyptian Museum. Galenishev continued teaching up until the end of the 1920s, and later mostly lived in Nice. Almost in seclusion, 
holding correspondence with his colleagues and doing translations. And a witness even writes that he passed away at his writing desk, bent over an Egyptian inscription. He died on the 5th of August, 1947, having bequeathed his entire archive to his French disciple, Sanfar Garneau. And the later established a whole research institute for the studies of Egyptian religion. This institute was named after Galenishev, Center W. Galenishev in Paris. But everyone remembers him as a professor of the University of Cairo. And it was Cairo where the condolence telegram was sent by Professor Pavlov from the Pushkin Museum of Fine Arts in 1947. The museum expressed commiserations on account of Galenishev's demise. Galenishev's successor, also a Russian expatriate, Vikentiev was teaching in Cairo at the time. He was not Galenishev's disciple, however. Vladimir Vikentiev also chaired the department in Cairo later. Such was the progression. So the telegram was addressed to him, and he replied. This was Galenishev's amazing life. The amazing life of Vladimir Galenishev his exceptional dedication to his work and commitment shine through all his wonderful collection of ancient Egyptian artifacts. From the smallest scarab to the unique funerary shroud depicting a woman and a child.